was interesting because uh, Pastor Roy had me share Friday night what I was feeling. And one of the guys after the service from Baru asked me, well, does that mean you're going to leave your Christian stuff? And I just, uh, I just kept going. I left it alone. I left it alone. Because the reality is Jews who believe in Yeshua, Jesus can be called Christian just as much as anybody else. Because the title Christian did not come from the people themselves. It came from the people in Antioch who were watching all of the people and they said, you look like Christ. And that's what the word means. The problem is there are too many Christians who don't look like Christ. And then we say we are. But if we look like Christ, then Christian is a good is a good name because the same we look like you, you look like the Messiah. So, yeah, we need to be like Him. So, as I said in the article, we were there. I encourage all of you, as you have opportunity, to go to any of the MJA conferences. Because there are Jews and Gentiles who go. I was in one conference and this couple goes up and, and they're asking all these questions and and he said, Well, are you Gentiles? And they said, Yeah, yeah. And he was I'm sure he was thinking in his mind that these questions are coming from false teachings that they have received in a certain church. And so he just, he was very gracious and just shared with him the truth. And, uh, and that was very good. But what I'm saying to you is the MJAA is not just for Jews, it's for Jews and Gentiles. And so there are many Gentiles who go to the conferences as well. So then I asked you a question. Have you ever experienced prejudice? Have you ever experienced prejudice? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Some people more than others. Some people more than others. But prejudice is something that, uh, well, the word itself comes from, as I say, the thing comes from two words, pre, prefix, and judge. So you are pre-judging something when you have prejudice and when you prejudge you're always wrong because you can never know the reality of what's going on so if you've experienced prejudice the people who are giving it to you are wrong and if you feel prejudice then you are wrong in doing that so Prejudice is something that comes within churches as well because of what Pastor Roy was saying the people who say you can't raise your hands or you can't do certain things in church, they have prejudged that. That is prejudice, even if we don't see it that way. So prejudice is always wrong. Always. Because we're not God. And so when we say that something that God says is okay, is wrong, we're definitely wrong. But what about things where God doesn't say anything? It's just clear that it's not in the Word. Well, if we make a judgment, a prejudgment, of it, then we're wrong because we should say, God, what do you say? Lord, what is the truth about this issue? Lord, what, what are you saying? What do you want to do? And what are, what is the reality of what you want in this issue? So we don't, we don't judge it until we get 
his direction on how to judge it. We're told to judge, but I always want to know how he wants to judge it before I want to judge anything. Okay? So, let's go in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 15. We're going to be there for just a few minutes, and then we're going to go to a passage in Matthew. Then we're going to go to a passage in Acts. We're just going to look around at some things because the Lord is uh, showing me some things that I've never really looked at before and understood before. So we're going to go with it. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 1. Adonai spoke to Moses in the air and saying, Speak to Benai Israel, that's the children of Israel, and tell them, When any man has a fluid discharge from his body, because of his discharge, he is unclean. When any man has a fluid discharge from his body, because of the fluid discharge, he is unclean. Now, let me just put this right out there. How many of you went to the restroom this morning? You're unclean. That's what it says. A fluid discharge. You're unclean. Any of you sneeze? You're unclean. Any of us, any of you cough? You're unclean. That's what that says. Okay? That's what that says. Most of the time we think, well, that's talking about sex. No, it says any fluid discharge comes out of your body. That means if you drool at night, <laughs> you're unclean. Yeah, that's what that says. Let's keep reading. This, this is to be his uncleanness in his discharge. Whether his body flows with his discharge or his body obstructs his discharge, it is his uncleanness. So you cut yourself and you bleed. You're unclean. That's what that's saying. Okay? Now, let's go down to verse uh, 9. Any saddle the one who has the discharge rides on will be unclean. Whoever touches anything that was under him will be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries them is to wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. So if you touch anything that anybody that is unclean does, then you become unclean and you have to bathe. Take, change your clothes and bathe. Okay? Now why did God do that? For one thing, He was trying to keep them healthy. Uh, that's, that's the big thing. He was trying to keep them healthy. We go to the sink and wash our hands and we use soap, right? They didn't have hand soap. They didn't have the pumps that you pump and you get the foam out. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of that. He doesn't say wash with soap and water. He says wash with water. Just water. Because that's all they had. So, but I'm going someplace with this. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. Okay, 
Let's go to verse 18 in Matthew chapter 9. Just as he was saying these things to them, a synagogue leader came and began to bow before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come lay your hand on her and she will live. And Yeshua got up and began to follow him with his disciples. Just then, a woman losing blood for 12 years. Losing blood for 12 years. That means blood was flowing out of her body, right? That means she was unclean. She was unclean. What did uncleanness mean in the Old Testament? Uncleanness meant you could not go to the tabernacle. You could not go to the temple in worship of God because you were unclean. Okay? Now, She's been losing blood for 12 years, came from behind and touched the tzitzit of his garment. For she kept saying to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be healed. Amen. Now, what we just read in Leviticus said that when she touched that tzitzit, Jesus, Yeshua, became unclean. Right, right. That's what it says. Right. He became unclean. He then needed to go wash himself, change his clothes, and he would be unclean until evening. That's what it says. But, Yeshua turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has made you well. That very hour, the woman was healed. Amen. When Yeshua came into the synagogue leader's house and saw the flute players and noisy crowd wailing, he said, go away. The girl isn't dead, but sleeping. They began cheering at him, but when the crowd had been cleared out, he went in and took his hand he went in, took his hand, and the girl took her hand, and the girl got up. And news of this spread around the region. If you touch something dead, you were unclean too. You became unclean. So he just had his tzitzit touched by the woman, the little tassel that hangs down, and she grabbed a hold of that. He became unclean. An unclean man goes into a house, the synagogue ruler's house, and takes the hand of a dead girl and says, get up. He just touched a dead thing and he became unclean. An unclean man became more unclean because he just touched a dead thing. So, What's the point? When Jesus went to be baptized, what happened? When he was baptized and he came up out of the water, what happened? A dove, A dove came down and landed on him. And the scripture says that's the picture of the Holy Spirit coming down. So, Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him. When Moses wrote the Torah, did he have the Holy Spirit in him? No. Jesus, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So Jesus is the Word, so the Word that was spoken to Moses and the Word that was written on the page is Jesus. He's the Word. He's the Word that said, if you touch a dead thing, you become unclean. 
He's the word that said if you have a discharge from your body, you are unclean. He's the word that said if you touch anything that that person who is unclean touches, you are unclean. That's, he's the word. So he's the one who wrote all of that. Okay? Why am I saying that? Because most of us believers look at those things and say, that doesn't apply to us. And we prejudge it. We have a prejudice against the law because the law doesn't, none of that applies to us, we think. Why doesn't it? Why doesn't it? Jesus is touched by a woman with an issue of blood, an unclean woman. And in her thought, she's thinking, all I have to do is touch his garment and I will be healed. And he turns to her and says, your faith healed her, healed you, healed you. He reaches out and touches. She reaches out and touches the seating of his garment and she's healed. Why? But did Jesus not become unclean? Why do we not become unclean? Holy Spirit. It's called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is was in Jesus. So when the lady touched him, what she felt coming out of her, out of him, was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit kept Jesus from becoming unclean. When he reached out and touched the woman's hand, the little girl's hand, he wasn't unclean, he was clean, and he was touching the little girl's hand as a clean man, giving to her the power of the Holy Spirit to rise from the dead, to get up. Now, I don't know if y'all understand this clearly, but what I'm saying to you is, because most of us have never lived thinking that when we went to the restroom, we're now cleaning, we can't go to church. But see, that's the issue that the people of Israel lived with. That's the issue that some of them are still living with. If they have a discharge from their body, they can't go to the temple. They can't go anywhere to worship God because they've got to wait a whole day. They've got to wash themselves and wait a whole day before they can go, before they're clean. Because they don't understand grace. They don't understand grace. And sometimes we don't understand grace. Because we allow the enemy to come to us and say, you're dirty. And we listen to it and we say, well, maybe I am. No, we're not. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And just like Jesus could go into that synagogue ruler's house and touch a dead body, take a dead body's hand and hold it and tell her to get up. And just like he could be walking and have a, a person with an issue of blood touch him and he would still be unclean, he was still unclean because the Holy Spirit was in him. And what I'm saying to you is, it's the same Jesus that wrote the words and gave the words to Moses. It's the same Jesus. So I can't be prejudiced against those words. I can't judge those words and say they're wrong. I can't do any of that. They're right. They were right. They were true for the people of Israel out there in the desert. And they're still true for anybody who has not received the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit into their lives. But then the Holy Spirit makes us clean. And again, 
I don't know what that is speaking to you, but it speaks volumes to me. Because there are things in life. You know, I heard on the radio the other day, I'm talking about people who go to work sick. And one guy called in and said, if we go to work sick, we can get fired. And that's, that's in our contract. If we go sick, we can get fired. And, and they said, well, how, how do you know if you go or not? There, you can go to work and you can be sneezing all over the place and you can be coughing all over the place and you can be doing all that kind of stuff. According to the Word of God, that makes you unclean and anybody that it touches makes them unclean. See, what I'm saying is that I'm not unclean when I sneeze because the Holy Spirit's in me. But do you want me to sneeze on you? No. 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 See, we look at it and we judge it, but we need to understand that God was trying to keep a, a group of people healthy. And so he knew that when you sneeze, sometimes it gets all over your clothes. Right? Or you go like that, and now it is on your clothes. And he knew how germs travel. So he said, don't go rub up against your wife with that, because then she can get the same sickness. So you go change your clothes, and you wash yourself with water, and you wait until the night, then you will be clean then you can go come and worship with, come and worship me at the tabernacle okay now let's go to Acts I'm going to go to Acts chapter 10 very familiar story but it's all the same issue now see, Peter and all of the apostles had a prejudice against Gentiles. All of them did. They had prejudged Gentiles. They had prejudged you. And said, you are not worthy of God. You're not part of Israel, so you're on the outside. That's what they believed. Peter, James, John, Andrew, all of the apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. All of them were Jews. So Peter has a vision. It says, the next day as the soldiers were traveling and approaching the city, Peter went up to the rooftop to pray at about the sixth hour. That's verse 9. Now he became hungry, very hungry, and wanted to eat. But while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet coming down, lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all sorts of four-footed animals and reptiles and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, Lord, for never have I eaten anything unholy or unclean. Why did he say that? Because God gave some directions about food that's clean and unclean too, didn't he? So he said, pork, pigs were unclean. He said, you're not supposed to eat stuff that crawls around on the ground and picks up trash and eats it. Scavengers. So, 
some of those scavengers have four legs. And so Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. I've never eaten anything unholy. Again, Says 
Caesarea Cornelius was waiting for them, and they called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found many people gathered. He said to them, You yourselves know that it is not permitted for a Jewish man to associate with a non Jew or to visit him. You know that. Yet God has shown me that I should call no one unholy or unclean. I should call no person unholy or unclean. That's powerful. So I came without objection when I was sent for. I asked them, what is the reason why you sent me? Sent for me. Cornelius declared, four days ago at this hour, I was praying Minka. I was praying the afternoon prayers. In my house, suddenly a man stood in front of me in shining clothes. He says, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your Zedekiah, your righteousness, remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea, so I sent for you immediately. You have been kind enough to come now and then. We are all here before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Okay. I want to say something here. The Jew, the, the Gentiles, and I was talking about earlier, who were asking a teacher a question, made this statement. He said, I thought Cornelius was already a believer. And the teacher said, No. He was a convert to Judaism, but he wasn't a believer in Yeshua, in wow. Jesus. And he said, well, the, the Gentiles said, well, I thought he already was. Where did he get that? <laughs> he says he's a righteous man. He prays. He was a good Jew. He was a Gentile acting like a good Jew. Living like a good Jew. He didn't know
prophets testify about him that everyone who puts his trust in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, fell on all those here in the Now listen to this next sentence. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were astonished. Because the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. Amen. Then Peter said, Can anyone refuse water for these to be immersed? Who have received the Ruach HaKodesh just as we did. So he commanded them to be immersed in the name of the Messiah Yeshua. Then they asked him to stay. See, we read all that and we don't see the reality of what was going on. I've read that for years and I did not see the reality of what was going on. Because I did not see a Jew going into the home of a Gentile. I didn't see it that way. Here's a Jew walking into the home of a Gentile. And he's got some other people with him. And according to what we just read, some of those who are in the circumcision group are with him too. Who want all the Gentiles to be circumcised. Just like they were. In fact, they believe that you should be circumcised before you can be a believer. Before you can be baptized, you have to be circumcised. So some of them are with him too. And all these people come with him. And they're in the home. But they go into a Gentile home. All of them. And he preaches. And the Holy Spirit falls on them. And they start speaking in tongues. Yeah, revival. Revival hits Cornelius' house. Peter then says, how can we keep them from the water? Why did he say that? He was looking at the circumcision group. And he said to them, how can we keep them from water when they have received the same thing we received? They have received the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. How can we keep them out of the water? Because this group said, they can believe that they have to be circumcised before they get baptized. So he looks at them and says, I can be keep them out of the right. Why would he say that to anybody else? So they all got baptized. Amen. They all got baptized. He commanded them to be immersed. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. And he did. Wow. See, the reality is, what we just read was the first time ever, according to the scripture, that a Jewish man went into a Gentile home to preach the gospel. Now, we know that Ruth married a Jew, but see, she said to Naomi, wherever you go, I'll know, wherever you believe, I'll believe, I'll, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So she was saying, I'm going to become a Jew. I'm going to live like you. She was a Gentile from Mary Boaz, who was in the line of Jesus. We know that. So we know that Gentiles came, but when Jesus
Gentiles came into the people of Israel, they had to live like the Jews lived. They had to live like the unclean and clean. They had to do the same things with the unclean stuff that the Jews did. It was all... So the very first time that a Gentile ever went into the Jewish home, he walks in and he says, I'm going to preach to you. The Holy Spirit falls. They all start speaking in tongues. Then he says, I don't think I'll stay here a few days. <laughs>
So, we need speaking tongues, praying tongues. We need to do all of that. And if we don't do it, ask God to give you tongues. That's all you got to do. Scripture says, you need to give, ask for it. Don't pray in tongues, pass. You'll give it to you. You need to pray in tongues, just like Cornelius is going to do. You know, one thing I, I haven't thought of until just now, maybe the reason that when Cornelius' family started speaking in tongues and all the Jews believed that what that, that it was God. It's probably because some of those in the circumcised group who also had the Holy Spirit interpreted the tongue. And so they knew that they were praising God. Now it says that they were praising God. Well, how did we know they were praising God? They were speaking in tongues.